Talking Memphis Wrestling with Randy Hill, featuring Michael St. John, Pat Tramp, and special guests. The bell is rolling, and we're off and running and we're ready to go with Talking Memphis Wrestling. It's a Tuesday night. It is October the 4th, and right around ringside with me is the assistant superintendent of Southside Schools, Chris Ellis, back after, man, you're busy as school started, but I hadn't seen you, and I, I forgot what you looked like. How you doing, Chris? I'm doing great, RH. Glad to be back. It's been a couple of weeks since I was able to be on. I see uh, Rand, Randy West said hello, and Shane says hello. Hello to those guys, and uh, I'm happy to be here tonight. Excited for the show. One of the things we're going to do, and I dedicated my show yesterday to this gentleman, and I will certainly dedicate the show today to a great friend of mine that we lost five years ago yesterday and we should have a lot of conversation about him on the day that lance's funerals happened we did a celebration of life on saturday october the 7th lance passed away on october the 3rd we had a celebration of life at jerry lawler's hall of fame bar and grill there at 159 Bill Street in Memphis, and just look at that picture right now, Chris. That's a great, great classic shot of Lance. Then beside a family picture with Lance and his three children, and also his wife. Great picture there. A picture of me and Lance. A picture of Lawler and Lauren and Lance, and of course the classic, classic picture of Lance and Dave Brown in front of that set fantastic fantastic and, and i love that so can you believe as i'm in the mood now as you see the shirt that i'm wearing the yellow again everybody's shirt with lance russell thoughts on the great lance russell well i've shared this on the show before i'm a twitter person as everybody that listens knows and there was a thing came up one day said if these guys were your Saturday morning favorites. You had a wonderful childhood. And it was a picture of Lance and Dave. And it was really, you know, I could obviously relate to that. And I remember how much I used to look forward to it every week. And Lance just brought so much credibility to it, made it so believable. And then getting to know Shane since I've been on here and hearing more inside stories about Lance. He was everything I ever thought he was. Absolutely, for sure. I want to say hello to Greg Peel, who's saying hello to everybody. Hello to Jim Early. Lance needs to be in the WWE Hall of Fame, and I agree with that 100%. Roger Calvert is in the house. Also, my buddy in Georgia, Al Tuttle, is in the house. Says hello, Randy, Chris, and everybody. Jeff Frog Wheeler is in the house. This is a great show every week. I appreciate that. Keith Jordan says, hey. He says, what? Then he says, hey, Randy. Hail. He don't know me too well because he misspelled my name. But <laughs> I'll forgive him for that for sure. And, uh, of course, Panetta's in the house. Tony's in the house. Shane Lanham in the house. Randy Dandy in the house. And I appreciate everybody being on today talking Memphis wrestling. So right now, I guess it's best if we go ahead and we discuss what's going to happen on the show. And and Keith also is in the house. Uh, did anybody post that? I'm just saying it needs to uh, remember an honor. We need to honor him. Uh, let's see. I don't know what we're talking about. What's Keith talking about? Do you have any idea? Lance. I think he's talking about the anniversary of Lance's passing. We need to make sure we honor him. I think that's what he's referring to. And we dedicated the show yesterday to that. I dedicated the show today to that. Jerry Lawler uh, posted multiple things. Dave Brown posted uh, multiple things. And I, 
I don't think we can be accused of not promoting Lance Russell and honoring Lance Russell as we do it on this show every single week for sure. As uh, Tony Edwards says, there's can never be a Mount Rushmore wrestling without Lance Russell. Absolutely, for sure, a hundred percent. I mean, he's the greatest there ever was. I mean, there's just no debate. People that say it's Jim Ross are wrong. The people that say it's Gordon Soley are wrong. It's Lance Russell with the greatest team ever. Anybody that says it's Jr. and Jerry Lawler, Jerry Lawler won't say that. He'll say it's Lance Russell and Dave Brown. There is no doubt about it. And it's been five years since he passed away on October the 3rd of 2017. A very, very, very sad day. Remember going to, I believe the visitation was on a Friday, then the memorial service at the Memphis Funeral Home took place on Saturday morning. I believe it took place at 11 o'clock in the morning. How appropriate is that? And then later that evening at Jerry Lawler's Hall of Fame Bar and Grill, we paid tribute and, and we had a party. We had a party. Shane wanted to do a toast and buy a fireball shot for everybody in the house, right? First of all, I quit drinking years ago. And second of all, as a general manager of the place, I didn't think and the, the rule was the employees can't drink while they work. And I certainly wasn't going to violate that rule at all. But what happened was Shane asked and I said, no, I'll, I'll, I'll toast with my sweet tea. He said, no, no, no. And he went to Lawler and Lawler said, Randy, go ahead and toast Lance. And he wasn't going to toast, toast because he don't drink alcohol at all. But I had one fireball shot on a toast. And so I did that, doing it for Lance Russell. And we had a great time. It was the first time I ever met Adam Dunn. Adam Dunn, my producer of the show, is certainly so helpful with this show. And on on that day, on October, as we we put the celebration up there, and I'm going to go ahead because I, Michael is in the backstage area, and I want Michael to see this graphic as he can speak to that. We had Lance's memorial service at the Memphis Funeral Home on Saturday, October the 7th. Uh, and we did it at 11 o'clock in the morning. Then that night, remembered Lance Russell. We remembered Lance Russell at from uh, 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock. And we had a party at Jerry Lawler's Hall of Fame Bar and Grill. That was a lot of fun in the house to talk about Lance Russell and anything else he wants to talk about as we get this thing going on a big Tuesday night of Talking Memphis Wrestling. Yesterday was the fifth anniversary of the death of Lance Russell, and we will bring in a partner to him on many a show, a good friend, and also, like us all, a big fan of Lance Russell, a classic. Michael St. John is another classic. He's our friend, and he's on the show right now with Chris. How you doing there, Michael St. John? Brother Randy, I'm doing fine if my cat doesn't turn off my microphone tonight, but uh, thank you for allowing me to be with you. And Coach, good seeing you in the midst of, uh, uh, we've turned Amen Corner down here in high school football, and it's getting interesting. But uh, first of all, on what you just uh, introduced, Randy, it, it was a very sad day when I heard that Lance had passed, and I got the call that morning uh, or right after he passed, and it, it was just a, it, it just, I mean, it, it's one of those things that, you really, uh, when you get to somebody or, or get with somebody that you really like and you, and you get used to being with them and you become their friend and they become your friend and you talk about things other than what you're there to do, whether it be wrestling or, uh, Lance was a great sports fan as I am. And, um, uh, it was just, it was, it was just almost so, so much fun to just be with him. And, but it was such an honor and, and I really admired him. Uh, you know, somebody I'd watched on TV in his early years and, and then having the opportunity in, in my career to work with a, a man like Lance and such a kind, sweet soul. It just, 
you know, you, 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 when you lose those kind of folks, you, you really take it to heart. And even to this day, Lance is one of the few people that, have, you know, that I think about and say, boy, I sure wish he was still around. And I say that about, uh, some other friends, not very, very few, I can assure you, but people like Tojo, Tojo Yamamoto is another one in that book for me is wish he was still around, wish Lance was still around. There's, there's a few like that. And coach, I'm sure you've got some in your in your lifetime that you, you feel the same way. And Randy, I know you feel the same way about that. You just wish they were still here. Absolutely. A hundred percent. This will be a big show today. And we got off by talking about one of our favorite subjects. One of the three of us favorite subjects and that is the great Lance Russell. And we lost Chris Ellis. He went away. And I don't know what happened there. And so we won't have a blank screen there. And we have Michael St. John and Chris Ellis is offline. And now he is back. Hey, Chris, I thought Michael pissed you off. You went away. No, I got, had a coughing spell there and I had to get off screen. And I tried to kill my mic, tried to drink a drink. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like Michael. It's uh Friends, like friends who you're close to, you have great admiration for. And usually people I found, and I, I don't know how Michael feels, but I think I kind of do. People in your business, your industry that you look up to, that influence you, mentors, so to speak. When you lose them, it really hits closer to home, I think. Because there's they just offered up nuggets of important information that you didn't even ask the question. They just knew you would need at some point. And I've had that in coaching. I've had that in racing. And obviously, you two have had it in the wrestling business. So those guys are always in your – they're in the back of your mind whether they're still here or not. One of the things I wanted to talk about right now is that uh, it's a part of getting older. And and I'm in a couple of months going to be 61 years old. And as you get older, you know, I've lost my parents, lost my – sister lost my grandparents you know you lost my mentor in eddie marlin and you know i still have my friend michael and friend pat and friend chris and adam dunn and i still have diane and randy up in hendersonville tennessee and i appreciate that very much and i'll be talking today and we'll get into it in a minute we're going to talk about road trips and we're going to talk about funny road trips crazy road Thrift and my favorite people to travel with on a regular basis. But we wanted to deal and talk about Lance as we get on the air. And the other thing, there was another death, and it reminds me of our childhood. And we'll let Chris and Michael both talk. At 90 years old today, the great Loretta Lynn passed away. The coal miner's daughter passed away on October the 4th, 2022 at 90 years old. She was born on April the 14th in 1932. She had so many, she was a country girl. She was a Kentucky girl. She was a coal miners girl. She had great hits like, don't come home with drinking, with loving on, on your, mind. your mind. Also, you ain't woman enough to take my man also you mess with my man we're gonna go to fist city also of course louisiana man louisiana woman mississippi man with conway twitty and of course her signature song coal miners daughter that she wrote and you know i love lyrics i love lyrics of music and i just wanted to real quick before we got chris and michaels and i'm hoping michael might have living in the national area as much as they did some have some loretta lynn stories the coal miner daughter she wrote this song now her first hit was uh, certainly in 1967 and that was don't come home a drinking with loving mm -hmm. on your mind but of course coal miner's daughter made a movie about it the story of her life and these words are just tremendous. Well, I was born a coal miner's daughter. 
in a cabin on a hill in Butcher Holler. We were poor, but we had love. That's the one thing that daddy made sure of. He shoveled coal to make a poor man's dollar. My daddy worked all night in the Van Leer coal mines, all day long in the field of hoeing corn. Mama rocked the babies at night and read the Bible by the coal oil light. And everything would start all over come break a morning. Daddy loved and raised eight kids on the miners' pay. Mama scrubbed our clothes on a washboard every day while I've seen her fingers bleed. To complain, there was no need. She smiled in Mama's understanding way. In the summertime, we didn't have shoes to wear. But in the wintertime, we'd all get a brand new pair. From a mail order catalog, money made from selling a hog. Daddy always managed to get the money somewhere. Yeah, I'm proud to be a coal miner's daughter. So a lot of things have changed since way back then. And it's good to be back home again. Not much left of the floor, nothing lives here anymore except the memories of coal miner's daughter. As we listen, fingers bleed to complain. There was no need. Shit smile and mommy's understanding way. In the summertime, we didn't have shoes to wear. But in the winter time, we all had a brand new pair. All right, Loretta Lynn, Miss Loretta, we'll start with you. Michael said, John, your thoughts on the life and the career and the songwriting ability, the song singing ability, and your memories. Michael said, John, of Loretta Lynn. You know, uh, I met Loretta Lynn. I was introduced to Loretta Lynn by her daughter. Uh, Crystal Gale, who uh, had a crossover top 40 hit. That was her sister. Her daughter was, sister. yeah, that was her sister. Okay, her sister. Um, I was uh, introduced to her uh, by her sister, uh, Crystal Gale, uh, back in 1978. And uh, she had a crossover top 40. Crystal had a crossover top 40 hit. And they came for an interview with Coyote McLeod on Kicks 104 Radio in Gallatin, Tennessee. And she came, Crystal came with her mom and, uh, it was a big deal. It, it was a big deal. It was a big deal back then. Uh, cause we didn't know Loretta was coming with her and, uh, it was in the morning and got there. They got there about seven 30 and stayed around till about nine 30 and drank coffee and ate Krispy Kreme donuts and, uh, uh, out on highway one Oh nine in Gallatin. And they were just ordinary folks. I mean, Randy, the great thing, I mean, coach, if you ever had the opportunity to, to meet either one of them, they're just ordinary folks, just like you and I and, and coach talking right now. I mean, there wasn't, you didn't think anything of it. It was just, they were just being them. And, and, uh, it, it was a lot of fun. We laughed and, and, and shared, like I said, some, some camaraderie and some of the other staff would come in and we'd introduce them and they, they took some pictures and we took some pictures and it was just one of those kind of fun days, but she sort of became the queen of country music. Um, I guess after Johnny Cash's wife died, June Carter Cash died, she became sort of the spotlight of country music. And now I really think that baton gets passed on to, to Dolly Parton because I think she's the next queen of country, if you would. But, uh, you know, it's so fun. I always, and in, in when I was in Los Angeles, I used to go to a lot of concerts, met a lot of artists that have had a, a blessed life, I guess you might say in that way. But the ones you always remember, are the ones that treat you like you know, like they're friends of yours, like they're part of you, your universe that that, are, that don't act like stars is what I'm trying to say. You remember those people that are just down to earth, kind hearted, fun, no pretentiousness. It it's just and and there are less of them than they are of the other kind. But uh, she certainly was, and of course. Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, interview quite a few of the country stars back when uh, the Lee Greenwood tribute was uh, filmed last October here in Huntsville at the Von Braun Center. 
and ran into Crystal Gale. And one of the questions I just asked her as we were standing there talking before I went on air with her is I just asked her, I said, how's your mom? Or, or, or I guess I, I screwed that up. But anyway, <laughs> she knew who I was talking about, but um, it was uh, it was a it, it was a, a good, good evening, too. And now, do you good remember? People, good people. Do you remember Michael Crystal's Gale's big big song? Do you remember that? Don't it make your bar bi- bi- only eyes blue? Yes, sir. That Absolutely. was the big one. 100%. But she's had quite a few. She's got, you know, the the beautiful thing about it is Loretta had a unique voice. Crystal had a very unique voice, a very beautiful voice. Loretta's voice was a little more of the raspy, down to earth. You sit, you hear her in church kind of thing, and Crystal was more of the professional voice that you would hear doing a you know, maybe a big time radio commercial for somebody that, but both of them are very talented and you hate to lose somebody that, uh, you know, somebody tweeted today and, uh, coach, it may have been, you, it may have been Pat, but one of you guys tweeted today that country music lost their queen, just like great Britain lost theirs. And that was a very good, very poignant, very poignant tweet. One of the things I wanted to real quick, I meant, meant to mention Adam usually produces this show, but he has had, no electricity, Georgia Power and Life. They have issues where Adam lives, and he's hoping he'll be on by the uh, sometime during this show. So far, not any luck at all. I'm going to put uh, Chris Gale, or not my friend Chris Gale, of course, in Memphis. I saw Chris, Chris Ellis to work right now. And Chris is going to kind of keep us up to date with uh, our friends making comments. Chris? Well, Referring to you know Loretta and Crystal Gale, Loretta is from an era that is to me she's the last of her era. The that came from the rural middle of nowhere. I mean, Johnny Cash came from the cotton fields of Arkansas. She came from the coal mines of Kentucky, and those type of people that doesn't happen anymore. They're they're those unless you've got money behind you or something backing you, promoting you, marketing you, YouTube, whatever it may be, putting up videos on social media so someone can find you, you don't come from nowhere anymore. And as I mentioned before we went on air, George Jones, Tammy Wynette, Johnny Cash, Loretta, Merle Haggard, Charlie Pride, all the people that I grew up with. My dad was in a band with Charlie Rich. All those people from the 70s that I grew up with, they're all gone now, except for, as Michael mentioned, Dolly. And Dolly's definitely the queen of country music now and such a wonderful person and does so many things for young people as far as literacy and reading. And that's in my realm, obviously, because I'm in education and we have some things she does for schools all over the country, maybe all over the world. But the impact they have is so far reaching, and yet they're still... I hate to use the word normal, but they're still like Michael's reference. They're just normal people. They're just every day down to earth. They just have a cool job. And that's that's not, you know, it's good to remember that they remember where they came from. And I don't think Loretta Lynn ever lost that. I think she was no. always proud of where she came from. And in fact, in 2019, I saw a video today as we're preparing for as I preparing for the show. Of course, she read the lyrics that Randy just read sitting on her porch and Hurricane Mills. And it's like she was reminiscing and, you know, being nostalgic about that time in her life. It was really moving. It was really a good deal. I'm glad I found it. Hey, Chris, catch us up on the comments. Our friend saying hello to us. I'm sorry. Uh, David says Dolly Parton was the next singer I was a fan of. Uh, David also says hello from Maysville. Rest in peace, Loretta. Tony says, I never thought about that before, Randy, but you're correct. Uh, Randy Myers says, I always thought she was the female version of Merle Haggard. Tony said, I love the coal miner's, do- coal miner's daughter movie also. And in that reference, that brought her to a different group of people. Like she was, I won't say past her prime, but some younger people got to see Loretta's story and kind of, got on board there. She kind of had a second run there after that movie came out, which was good. Absolutely. For sure. Appreciate everybody with comments. Now we're going to Randy, if if I may, there's breaking news in the sports world. 
Aaron Judd just hit his 62nd home run for the New York Yankees. All right. First absolutely. at bat tonight against Texas in the first inning down in Dallas. Any way to pick up the audio? Uh, no, I don't have my TV connected. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping up with them. The Braves in Miami are two to one in the sixth. And if the Braves win, they're in. So just sort of keeping up with stuff. But I thought uh, knowing our fan base and knowing the people that are on this panel, the Aaron Judd thing is a pretty big thing. He's a, he comes off as a great guy. I was just reading an article in today's New York Post. Apparently, he's given away tons of money, uh, unspeakable to the media, but he gives the money to these schools that need that fall in hard times, and he he builds basketball courts and he he builds playgrounds. And what a great guy! I mean, you you got to root for you, even if you're not a Yankee fan. My gosh, you got to be an Aaron Judd fan if he's doing good things for other people. And I was in a situation where, where Michael, I was afraid. There's not many games left in the regular season, and it was getting close, and the pressure was on. So how do you guys take it? He now surpassed Roger Maris, correct? That's right. But he has not uh, so surpassed Bonds and, and – uh, and McGuire and, and some of the other guys. And Sosa. And Sosa. Who do you consider the home run king? I mean, who do you consider? Do you just throw out the I don't, I don't like him, but Barry Bonds is the home run king. Because here's something people don't understand. Two things. Media, the media produced the term performance-enhancing drugs. It's steroids. The term performance-enhancing drugs is media and here's why i say that there were over 100 minor leaguers suspended for failing tests never made it to the big leagues so if it enhanced their dang performance why didn't they make it you have to barry be bonds, able to hit the ball yes yeah, barry, bonds, yep. barry bonds the year he hit the home run record he swung and missed you can look this up he swung and missed 38 times for the year i'm talking about didn't foul it off, didn't hit. He swung and missed 38 times in 600 at-bats. There's no medicine, no pill, no, no. drug can make nope. you do that. I'm sorry. He's the home run king. I don't even like Barry Bonds. I don't even like him, but he, he earned it. There he, and we don't even know who was on steroids he was playing against either. So, oh, well. Well, we Babe Ruth was on Babe Ruth was on whiskey half the time. Yes, yes, yes. Or, you know, absolutely. are we going to? cross him all the how to, i agree with coach uh it's not easy i played baseball i know i went out for my college team and got cut the first day i i know how hard it is to hit that ball and and anybody that's even played the game or played softball understands that and i i agree i'm not a big fan of barry bonds i'm not a big fan of mark mcguire's i think sammy sosa out of the three was probably one that i would be more of a fan of but randy i agree with you you still gotta hit the ball and you got to hit it out of the park, whether you're on Jack Daniels or whether you're on steroids. And so big thumbs up from Talking Memphis Wrestling. Not that he's listening and watching, but Aaron, God, we salute you. You did good. Now, we started off talking about Lance, and then we talked about Loretta Lynn, and we had the breaking news talking about Aaron Judge and breaking or hitting Oh, so I guess he hit 62, right? Is that 62. right? 62. Yes, sir. It's 62. Another big news in wrestling uh, this week. And again, I am having to produce this show as well as, as directed. The King with a great that we lost just the other day. The great Antonio Anoki, born. February the 20th, 1943, passed away October the 1st of this year. He was 79 years old. He became a professional wrestler September the 30th, 1960. He retired from the ring in 1998. He was trained by Rick Dozen at age 17, trained with Baba Carl Gotch, also helped Training. He started New Japan Pro Wrestling and in 1970, uh, 1976 had the big mix match 
there was Muhammad Ali in Japan that was big news. Um, Antonio Inoki has to be certainly one of the most famous uh, personalities ever in Japan. I mean, huge, and he was huge worldwide. So I think we have to talk, as wrestling fans, we have to talk about the mark that this guy, as an owner of the company, as the person that brought in MMA to Japan, the person uh, that brought and used so many American wrestlers, so a guy that was successful and became a senator in Japan. He's the real deal, real deal, and certainly our thoughts and prayers to all his fans and friends. Michael, your thoughts on the great Antonio Anoki, who we lost the other day. Randy or Coach, do you guys remember when Anoki wrestled for Nick? in Nashville and in Memphis and in Birmingham and in Chattanooga back in the day. He came through the territory. In the 60s. Yes. Late I listened to a Jim Cornette. I listened to a Jim Cornette podcast, and Anoki never got this as long as he lived and held a grudge because he started the same time as Giant Baba did. Baba and Anoki both ended up after their their mentor was killed, was murdered, and went away. They started their own career. However, they started the very same time. Anoki was sent to Nick, to mm -hmm. Tennessee. And a lot of times he was up in the Knoxville area and in East Tennessee in an area that was not not very good as far as payoffs are, are concerned, where because of the height of John Battle, they sent him to Madison Square Garden oh, yep. and main events at Madison Square Garden, mainly because of his height, wrestling Bruno and all kinds of uh, people. And they sent an okay to get here to, to wrestle uh, our top star, maybe not even our top star. But yeah, he always hated Baba. He blamed Baba for that fact and hated the fact that he got to go to Madison Square Garden and, and Anoki went to Tennessee. So yeah. you're right Anoki, on that. Anoki got to stay at the Sam Davis Hotel in downtown Nashville. Uh, I heard a story and this was back when I was working in, in uh, with, uh, with, and I think I heard, I heard this while I was working still with Nick before uh, Jerry bought him out and all that stuff. I heard that Anoki when he came, one of the, they brought him in as an attraction, as the giant Japanese, as a big Japanese star, because he was tall, and they brought him in as an attraction, and Nick paired him up against the guy that had the wrestling bear, and in a and and apparently in one of the weeks on the on the circuit, Anoki traveled and in every town wrestled the bear. And I just, I found that to be hilarious. Yeah, it is hilarious. Probably, gentlemen. Uh, being the the trainer was it Nick Adams? I think it was Nick. Yeah, I think it was Nick Adams. But yeah. I, you know, but Inoki, I, I I do remember seeing him on on TV uh, in Nashville and on Birmingham TV, and uh, uh, he could he didn't speak a lot of English on camera, and I want to say they had him paired with may have been even Saul Weingroff when he was in the territory, but uh, they had a somebody that you know spoke for him and. Uh, they they pawned him off as the one the greatest Japanese star ever, and he'd come to this area because he's seeking competition and scouting talent, even at that age. But uh, you talk about the the impact of Inoki. Uh, it, it was there a more was there more of a promoter's promoter ever in the wrestling business than than Inoki? Because mm -hmm. when you think about him, you you just brought out a bunch of stuff that but but he he. He was always promoting and always promoting and always promoting. And I know a lot of guys that went over to, to be in Japan on the show for him that came back, and apparently they were treated really well. The only complaint I ever heard about going over to Japan, and I want to – gosh, I was thinking Big John Stutter, one of those guys once said it. He said the only problem was Inoki would put you up or, or get you in a nice hotel, but the beds were about two feet too short. 
Yes. And your legs would hang off the end of the bed. I, but I never heard a complaint about any of the boys that went over there on payoffs or on travel or anything other than the fact the beds were too short. Chris, your thoughts on the note? Well, I have a couple uh, from the wrestling side. When he wrestled Ali in 76, I remember that vividly. Of course, then Lawler wrestled Rocky Johnson. You know, in 1976, yeah. the same, the same concept. You know, I remember that very well. He looked like a fantastic athlete. But now, when when I met Bill Eady in Jackson, when I was with URH, and he talked to me about, he made his most money working in Japan. He loved working in Japan and talked about. He, I mean, he had reverence for Anoki and Baba, and like talked about working for both of them and the money they made and. I mean, it was really good to get that insight from, and for those who are listening that may not know who Bill Eady is, that's the mass superstar. But anyway, he was a, you know, it was very, I just, I was enthralled because he's talking about it, you know, and just, he, he just bragged on Japan. So if he could have, he just worked Japan and took off the rest of the time, if I'd been, if he could have made enough of a living. But he just, I mean, had reverence for him. Cool, cool. Now, we got a lot of stuff planned. I've been promising for two weeks that we're going to do tell some good old scandalous road stories. And I will do that. And I will tell you some of my favorite people in the world to ride with. Randy West, I hope you're listening because you made the list. He didn't make number one on the list, but he made number two. How about that? And we'll get to that in a minute but it's just so much news and and michael's not helping that out things he's doing his job by being the professional he is and we had late breaking news and he broke the news aaron judge but we do have to talk about tales from the territory and i gotta find that graphic here somewhere this is when i need adam done and i am having trouble getting that on and well there it is tell from the territories premieres at nine o'clock central standard time from the producers of the dark side of the ring and also from seven bucks production dwayne johnson the rocks production company a look at the territory it's a 10-week series that starts tonight at nine o'clock central standard time they start with the memphis territory episode number one episode number two will be a look at the andy kaufman versus king also you will see the awa body slams and the heartland you will see stampede wrestling the hearts of pro wrestling other episodes Mid-Atlantic Wrestling, Portland Wrestling, Mid-South Wrestling, Championship Wrestling from Florida, Big Time Wrestling in San Francisco, Central States in Kansas City, again from Seven Bucks Production and the producers of the Dark Side of the Ring. And certainly, 9 o'clock tonight, if you get Viceland TV, I'm having trouble with my fire stick, and I can't get the sucker to play. I was planning to have this show off the air by the time it starts. Now, before we talk into it, I'll ask Chris first. Do you get in your south side cable that you have up there, do you get Viceland TV, Vice TV? Well, I have Direct TV, and I have the DVR set because I don't know if we get off in time. But i got to ask this question. I have okay. to ask. Is it called Seven Bucks Production because that's what he made working for y'all? when he came to USWA? No. Bruno loaned him $7, and that's why he called it 7 bucks. I got you. I knew there was a connection there, but I was, I, was, I knew you, I, I can't believe I didn't get a better comeback than that. I thought <laughs> I was really guess. Yeah, anyway. Uh, Randy it's also, true. isn't Danny Garcia the Rock's ex-wife? Yes, and she, she and Dwayne Johnson own seven bucks production. Okay. Yeah. Chris just had to have that smart ass. Everybody has to have the dig on the Tennessee territory. No, I, I love the Tennessee territory. By the way, they couldn't have a Tales from the Territory 
Memphis had to be the first episode. First two. I mean, yeah, first but I mean, it episode. had to be Memphis first. first. Absolutely. First Absolutely. I think that's a testament to what Memphis wrestling meant to the rest of the world. I really do. I think that's a testament to that. If you got a second, Randy, I got, I got the, uh, I've got the, uh, the, uh, trailer up. We can play if you want it. Okay. All right. It's the audio. The audio the of business was protected and the passionate fans still believed. The world of the squared circle was divided into territories. What you're about to hear are the stories of those fabled days from the road and the ring, told by the legends who lived them. This is Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and these are Tales from the Territories. The Michael, do you get by? A lot of things about it that were unique. One of the things, me growing up as a kid, watching it on TV and go, <laughs> That's real. As long as you kept it real, you could do anything in the wrestling business. The crowd was so into it, and they were having such a good time, and we were having such a good time. Now the people sit back and say, this is a little different here. You never knew from week to week what to expect. So if the people are ready, and all you jerks at home are ready, this is history. Whoa. We used to pride ourselves if we could create a riot, if we could get a fan so upset and so mad that they would jump up out of their seat and forget the fact that they may go to jail or get beat up and want to jump in the ring to help. When we got back to the locker room, me and Jimmy would high-five each other. Did you see that guy <laughs> jump in the ring? He's great. <laughs> That whole uh, that whole uh, thing right there, uh, Randy was all about Memphis. I mean, that was the whole thing they showed on that trailer was was the Memphis, and the, of course, you probably recognized all the voices. But one thing I noticed on the trailer, though, uh, number one, Jerry Jarrett looks great on on this this thing, and I was surprised that they didn't do a better job with with Lawler on his makeup because actually Jerry uh, Lawler ended up looking like the oldest one at the table. But I'm looking forward to it. this. Is going to be a fun one at nine o'clock tonight. Do you get Vice on TV? I do have, I have direct TV here at the house and I've got Vice as one of my favorites. So I just pop my favorite button and go right to it. So uh, you have it, uh, you can watch it if we go a little over, right? Yeah, I've got, I've got my TV on right now, but uh, I may have to take leave. My, my, my grandson has been diagnosed with our, RSV, RS, the, the lung thing. RSV, yes, sir. Yeah. And so, uh, but uh, his daddy was supposed to bring him over at eight o'clock. So I may have to take leave of you for, if he does come over, but I haven't gotten, a, got my phone here with me, but I haven't gotten a message he's coming yet. But anyway, I, 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 I've been looking this tales of the territory. This is a great idea. And, and the being that wrestling uh, back when is probably the hottest thing in wrestling right now. Wouldn't you agree? Because all the podcasts that are so popular, all the TV shows that have hit about this, whether it be on A&E or whether it be on Vice or whether it be some of the things that they've done on ESPN or USA or whatever. In my opinion, guys, retro wrestling is the hottest thing going over the WWE, AWA, New Japan, Impact, or anybody else that's out there live in today's world. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's hot as a... Hotter than a firecracker. Absolutely, Michael. Good point. Well, yeah, I, I think, think this show's going to be big. I think retro wrestling's big because, as the headline says on my direct TV when I was looking at it, it says when wrestling was real. A That's good what point. It the statement says season one, episode one, and it says Memphis when wrestling was real. And we thought it was, you know, Blake Shelton has a song. When Hollywood was fake and wrestling was real, we all thought it was real. We all thought they were, and it's ironic. I was selling this to the kids today at school because they always ask me about wrestling because they know I do this and I'm a huge fan. And well, a kid asked me the universal question, is wrestling fake? And so I said, go on YouTube, find a video of, of uh, The Rock and Mick Foley chair shots. Just type that in, watch that. You tell me if it was fake. Of course, they came back. Oh, man, they about killed. He about killed him, you know. But and I, I try to show them old video from Memphis and Lawler's and Dundee matches and so on and so forth. But anyway, 
we all thought it was real and and not to say it's not i'm not saying it's not real we didn't we didn't know it was predetermined back then i should say on the road again i can't wait to get on the road again people ask me what was your favorite part of the wrestling business and there was such great things that i really enjoyed i love being in the arena i love smelling the popcorn i love the the go getting to the towns i like the excitement and the pressure of producing the television show but there was nothing better than on the road again can't wait to get on the road again talking wrestling with my friends the very first pro wrestling person that I ever talked, that I ever rode with in my life was Eddie Marlin. This was taken about a month, a month and a half before Eddie passed away in his hospital room, me and Eddie Marlin. Eddie Marlin, my mentor, Eddie Marlin, without him, there would be no Randy Hills in the wrestling business. Now, am I going to say on these road trips that I have the most fun with Eddie Marlin? Not going to say that at all because Eddie was a part of the office when I was just one of the boys and a young punk kid. And certainly I wasn't going to do the stuff that I would later do in front of Eddie Marlin in the first place. But Eddie Marlin certainly respect him uh, more than anybody. And here's a great picture. There's Eddie looking down at my friend Randy Wade. His dad was the chairman of the wrestling committee. And you know Randy Wade, don't you, Chris? Yes, sir. I was going to say, that's, that's Randy Wade. I can tell with that smile. Eddie Marlin, Randy Wade, and Randy Hills right, right there. And just great people to ride with. And uh, the, the first person on my list, certainly, is... Eddie Marlin and means uh, so much to me in my life. There's uh, no doubt about that. And I am trying to, uh, my production thing is not getting me off that picture. And I'm trying people and it's not doing it. And just give me patience. Patience deal. And while we're trying to get that picture off, Michael, you talk about Eddie Marlin, talk about what he meant to you, and talk about any trips you made with Eddie Marlin. Well, Eddie drove quite a bit between Hendersonville and Memphis on Saturday mornings uh, in, in, the, in his Lincoln Continental with Jerry Jarrett up front, and I'd be in the back seat with Jeff or with Tojo or whoever was going down with us, sometimes by myself. And I didn't have a lot to say, uh, because they talk about TV. They talk about other things as well. And I just listened, especially on the wrestling side of the thing. I didn't, I didn't open my big mouth on, on when they were talking about wrestling. Cause I was there to observe and to learn and, and boy, you got a college education every week. I can assure you of that. But Eddie was one of the most, uh, I always had such great respect for Eddie. He was such a, a, a great person. Um, uh, not only a good wrestler back in the day, but he was just a great person. He's a great granddad. He was just, he's the kind of person that, you, you know, my granddaddy, and in, in fact, Eddie reminded me a lot of my granddaddy and in, in his ways and the, in the things he said and the way he conducted himself. And it was always, always a gentleman, always a gentleman, just a great, great man. There's one of my favorite people up there right now. You, you put Randy West picture up there. There's none better than that fellow. I'll tell you. I got news for you. If he was, if he was still shooting the wrestling shows, I guarantee you they'd be a heck of a lot better than they are now. I, he, he, the master, the master. One of my absolute favorite people in the world. There is the great genius cameraman and production guy for Jarrett Promotions, Randy West, and that is the young lady beside him is my friend and Eddie Marlin's youngest daughter. That is Diane Marlin West. Man, a lot of great stories. Oh, and I believe it or not, because Randy behaved himself, I can tell every single one of the stories. There's nothing that I have to cover for Randy West because he just didn't drink. He just got in the car and he drove. And he dipped his red man or his Levi Garrett, that sort of thing. But he just getting us back. So he had a van and we load up that van 
back in the days when I started making road trips and moved to Nashville in 1987. We'd get in the van about 12.30 in the afternoon on Mondays, and most of the time, Randy would just go to Memphis on Monday nights, and we would be there around 4 or 4.30 to do localized promos, and Randy would do the driving all the way there. Randy would do um, the driving uh, all the way back, and this is a recent picture when uh, for his anniversary that he had recently, and I think it was anniversary number 50, anniversary number 50, and they went and had a great vacation. Before that, they went with the daughter Tammy and her family and went to Boston. So that doesn't look, does that look like a Boston uh, tree or a Florida, Alabama tree, Michael? That ain't no Boston tree, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> that looks like a Florida tree. I'll be honest with you. That that looks like a Florida tree to me. Randy, so, I, have, I have a question. I have a question about Randy West. Okay. Was he was he smart? Did they smart him up to do the bro, the video back then? No, he smartened no. himself up just being around. No, no, no. Yeah. They didn't smart him up. He just but they put him in a situation where he would become smart if that makes sense, you know, yes. he would be in the dressing room and that sort of thing. I have a story in one of the rare wrecks that I've ever been. And this is a story twofold. It's a story about a wreck and it's a story about making the towns, always making the towns. So we had to do interviews and I was staying uh, during the week before I moved to Nashville, I was staying um, on Monday nights, I would usually stay with Eddie, and on Tuesday nights after Louisville, I would stay with Randy West, or whatever the case. Sometimes I'd stay at Jerry Jarrett's. I was kind of all over the place. But we left Randy West's house about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We're going to go shoot promos and, uh, in Springfield, Tennessee. It was in 1985, and Tom Modesto was doing the book and so Randy and I loaded the van out, the camera case, the the, the blank cassettes, the tripods, the, the curtain, uh, everything we need were loaded up. So we left 469 Cumberland Hills Drive where Randy West left at the, lived at the time. He doesn't live now there now, buddy. So if you want to go talk wrestling to Randy West, don't go to 469 Cumberland Hills Drive. Don't go to see Jerry Jarrett at 467 Cumberland Hills Drive because he don't live there either. Randy lives in Hendersonville. Jerry Jarrett lives in Franklin, Tennessee. Anyway, so Randy's driving. I'm in the passenger seat. So we're going down Cumberland Hills Drive. And you know that goofy, dangerous curve on Cumberland Hills Drive, Michael? I do. So, I went up and down that many a time. So this one teenage driver, man, took it too fast. It was raining and lost control and hit us head on. Hit us head on, totaled the van. But thank God, Randy Dandy wasn't hurt. This Randy wasn't hurt. Just the van was hurt. But the camera equipment, thank God, it was safe because we had a task to do. So that was back before cell phones. So Randy said, we got to do something. I said, yeah, we got to get a, we got to get a car. I said, we got to get a car. Uh, he said, call Jerry. Uh, I said, okay, but we didn't have a cell phone. So I had to go knocking on doors in that neighborhood uh, asking to use a phone. Cause that's what that, the kids today can't comprehend that Michael and Chris, <laughs> they can't comprehend that, but I'm knocking on the door and, and I might have been bleeding a little bit. I don't remember if I gashed my head or I might have been trying to, I'm a wrestling guy, I might be trying to embellish the story a little bit. But we call you it got Jerry. juice for a wreck? Maybe I'm lying. Maybe I'm embellishing. But it sounds better when I said I, I got juice. So let's let's keep it with juice. I had terrible juice. Man, I'm getting blood all over the place. 
Randy West was wrapping me up, spirit of 76, man. It was terrible. I could have died. I was bleeding so much. It was terrible. But we had to make the booking. So I knocked on the door, and I used the telephone. Phone. They didn't have cordless phones because it was raining. Did I say she didn't want me to get mud on the carpet? So she gave me the cell phone. I called Jerry Jarrett. I said, we need a vehicle. She said, all right. I said, yeah, we need a vehicle. We got to go to the town. So he loaded up the limousine that he bought for the sole purpose for the Fabulous Ones videos and let them do their entrances. They still had that. So here he comes. Uh, pulls up in the limo. So we load the stuff out of the fan in the limo. We go back to Jerry Jarrett's house, drop him off. And he said, y'all just take the limo to the town. So we go to Springfield, Tennessee and shoot the interviews and do everything we have to do. But we could have been killed, Chris. We could have been killed. We could have been killed dead. Michael said, John, how do you like that story? Way too true and way too scary. But you made the town. Yeah, I made the town. Frank Sidden. Uh, see, I'm trying to, oh, he's still, I'm got to recap these things. I'm seeing if Randy West is still in the house. I told that story about Randy West, and Randy West didn't even deny it, didn't confirm it, didn't say if I was bleeding. He didn't say if he was bleeding. He might not be watching right now, David Lindell says dirty roads. I don't know what the hell that has to do with the price of tea in China. Uh, Toby Orban is talking about something. I hope it makes more sense. Uh, Randy They're got lucky. You know. They were talking about Tom Ernesto. When you said Tom Ernesto, it turned into the original assassins. They talked about the assassins that worked in Memphis. They said, don't forget fire and flame. And then he referred to dirty roads. That's how that all transpired, Randy. Okay, very good. Hey, hey, look at Randy West. He says he's still here. He says you were selling LOL. You're dang straight I was selling. We could have been killed, me and Randy West. So, again, Randy was always fun. We had a good time. We shared. Randy, I don't know if you know this, but Randy's a hell of a musician. And he he still has his music room. He has guitars. He has a guitar. Billy Travis couldn't play a guitar. Neither could Jeff Jarrett. But Randy West, by good can. Now, Randy West had used the combination of his love for wrestling and doing his job for his love with music. Remember the deal, the idea of Don Bass turning into the singing cowboy Don Bass. You remember that? No, that one. No. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, I don't get that. I, I don't remember that. I I remember. That you was that was a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Randy West idea, Randy West idea. Idea. So why I look for the next person I'm going to talk about, I'm going to let you say a few more nice words about Eddie Marlin and Randy West. Well, first of all, uh, nice is, is, is there's not a nice no, enough nice words to say about either one of those. Um, I can tell you that I, Randy and I spent some uh, long nights and some some very productive nights and some very uh, creative nights. And I apologize for all the bust I did on camera because I'd, I'd be instructed to say something and I'd have it in my head to say it. And there were some nights that I'd be so tired after my day job at Kix 104, Y107, Randy had to put up with me saying, hey, wrestle, yeah, bust. And do that 12 times. And uh, I know his lovely bride wasn't real happy for with me when I would do that because I was keeping Randy up late at night. But yeah, I'll tell you, that it, 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 there was a chemistry. You know, and when you talk about people like Eddie and, 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 and Randy and Jeff and Jerry and all the guys, and there was a mat. You know, people talk about Memphis in, in glowing terms and what a great, great run it had. There was a camaraderie. There was a magic. There was a family. There was a, commun a community. There was a unity of, of everybody involved. And, and I remember that when I first got to go to Memphis TV and do the first time, the first time I went to channel five and did the show, uh, the one thing that amazed me is 
the floor director was into what he was doing. Guy Coffee was into what he was doing. The boys in the back were into what they were doing. Everybody was on point. And you don't get that hardly ever with anything, whether it's baseball, football, basketball, wrestling, business, uh, whatever you're doing. Uh, you just don't get that kind of cooperation and community all together for the purpose of one thing, and that's to draw money on Monday night. And make everybody happy. So I think that's one of the things that gets overlooked was the, the organization. I, I mean, Jerry Jarrett did not run his organization with an iron fist, in my opinion. He ran it with compassion. Now, was he tough and was he demanding? Absolutely. But he wasn't iron fisted. It wasn't like my way of the highway. You know, I hear some tales. I've heard tales about Bill Watts. Heard some tales in the Carolinas about... Uh, the folks there, I've, I've heard some tales, many tales about Eddie Graham down in Florida, and everybody had their own style. But I don't think in any territory from, and, and I had an opportunity to be on Georgia TV, on Georgia Championship Wrestling. I had an opportunity to see matches in Florida, in fact, involving Jerry Lawler in, in Tampa at the uh, Raymond Hester, or the Hester Army, the James Hester Army Armory. Yeah, in, Hester Army, yes. Yeah, yeah, right over by the High Life Fontaine. But uh, I and I had an opportunity to go to WWF matches in in New England when I was working up there, and into the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles, and to the uh, the Celebrity uh, and the uh, uh, the uh, Veterans Memorial in Phoenix, and in other markets that I worked in, St. Louis, going to wrestling at uh, at the at the uh, Keel Center. I went one time to Cobo Arena to see the matches there. I never got the feeling on either side of the camera, on either side of the fence, of the camaraderie and the continuity and the family that you got with the Memphis show. And even working for, for Nick Goulas and being allowed into his inner sanctum, there was, and, and I've told the story before, and I don't hold any begrudge in any in, in any way, shape, or form. Nick Goulas was good to me. I know that that's not the, the story that everybody tells. But there wasn't there wasn't that sense of everybody pulling the wagon the same direction everybody giving it their all on every play you know you use all the sports uh idioms in in talking about this but in memphis that was sort of the underlying thing you were part of the family or you were you weren't going to last there long and i know when jerry took the Memphis style to, to Dallas to, with the, with the uh, world-class and took over world-class and tried to integrate their people with the Memphis people. I think the only people that really shined through and, and stood and kept with it were people that had come through the Memphis territory and it ended up in Dallas and, and when all was said and done, but uh, a lot to be said. And of course we're less than an hour away and we're going to see uh, some of the behind the scenes and hear some of the high behind the scenes tales on vice TV as well. I got to tell these stories. I might've over told the stories, but they are great stories. And the very first class of the Memphis wrestling hall of fame in March of 1994 was the honorable and Imperial Tojo Yamamoto. Just this month, as we're once again trying to update the Hall of Fame and put this put in this year and get new draftees on on people that we have lost. Tojo Yamamoto is classic, and I will give you a couple of Tojo stories. Then we'll have Michael tell any experiences and maybe. Who knows? Maybe Chris ran into Wendy's and saw Tojo Yamamoto in the Wendy's in Jonesboro, Arkansas one day. The first memory I have of Tojo is from being a kid. And Tojo, not a big guy, but he was bigger than life. You thought he was big. The, the wooden shoe, the whole nine yards. And, of course, you know, just his how he talked and that sort of thing. One of the very first things, once I started being allowed in the dressing room and that sort of thing, I've told this story before, and this is how the business has really changed. And we're going to take a little time out, and, and, and I'm going 
to add something that uh, I heard on Busted Open and Bully Ray today because he did a great thing on Bully Ray and he's talking about the young guys today in the business do not respect the business, does not protect the business at all. Now, back in those days, that's why I wanted to take what Bully Ray said on the show today and talk about it as we're talking about Tojo Yamamoto. Tojo came to me uh, in the dressing room or maybe we were making a car trip and we made a lot of car trips, an uh, absolute ton of car trips. Tojo came up to me and said, Bugs Bunny, this Tojo talking about Bugs Bunny, Bugs Bunny was Eddie Marlin's CB handle, and he said the little man, and everybody called Jerry Jarrett the little man. He's Tojo says Randy Hill, Randy, he called me Randy Hill, Randy Hill, Randy Hill, little man, and and Bugs Bunny love you, but they're letting you in our business. But you run your mouth, Tojo kill you. You run your mouth, Tojo kill you. He was protecting the business. It was the responsibility back in the day of the people and hopefully then as the business has changed, but you can still protect the business and you can still respect it yourself and you can still refrain from doing stupid stuff and you can still point out people. You know, Tojo wouldn't be uh, political correct now because am I scarred for life that Tojo Yamamoto said, respect the business or I'll kill you. Am I scared, scarred for, for life because of that? No, I'm not scarred uh, for life in any stretch of the imagination whatsoever at all. Uh, in any, any uh, way at all was I uh, scarred for life and I'm trying as I'm doing a passionate promo, I know, we'll come back all three of them on the thing. And I have two funny Tojo stories, two hilarious Tojo stories to tell you. And I will do that in just a minute. But we'll just go real uh, quick. Does that make sense to you, uh, Chris, that I was so fortunate uh, that I knew how serious it was that Tojo was teaching me. Tojo says, I'll kill your ass. Now, that's something you'll never forget. And uh, I haven't been, not many people starting to kill me. Now, he's not the only one. I've had four or five <laughs> over the years of, or so. You can't be a wrestling booker and not get a life. You're not worth the salt in the world if you don't get somebody like a Manny Fernandez threatening to shoot you with a machine gun or whatever the case may be. But still, Tojo saying that took it serious. Now the business has changed and it's opened up and we're our own enemy and all the stuff. And Cornette does the inside show. Jerry Jarrett does the inside show. Bully Ray does the inside show. You can still certainly protect and respect the business. There is no doubt in the world. But Chris, do you understand the fact how Tojo threatened to kill me and still I respect Tojo Yamamoto, the late great Tojo Yamamoto, more than anybody because he was teaching me to respect and protect this business. And if he would have taught me that lesson, maybe I ran my mouth to somebody. Maybe I would run my mouth to somebody. Maybe I would spark somebody up. <laughs> and that would have hurt the business. That would have hurt the business. So Tojo had big impact in my life, Chris. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it goes back. It was a different era, not only in the wrestling business, but in society. We were taught to respect our elders. So you respected him automatically because of his stature, because of who he was. He had your respect going into it. And then because you loved it and want to be a part of it, you're willing to go along and, 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 and listen more than we talk. It took me a long time to learn that. Like you got two ears and one mouth for a reason. And when you listen to those guys, it's called wisdom for a reason. He's provided you wisdom and insight. And 
We didn't live in the politically correct era. Now, I don't know if he would have literally killed you, but you'd have probably gotten the crap knocked out of you for, you know, and told don't open your mouth again. And I mean, I mean, I go back to Schultz and Stossel, you know, open your mouth and get the consequences. I mean, those guys protected it then. And, and now, like being having because of URH being around guys from that era, and I'm a big talker. If you ever notice when we're around those guys, I don't talk. I right. wasn't in the business. I don't have an opinion. I listen to them. They were there. They lived it. They sweat, bled, made the road trips. I'm a fan. Shut up and listen. Michael, your thoughts on the, mes the message Tojo Yamamoto had to me, and also the subject of the bus that opened today as Bully. Now, here's another thing Bully says, and we're going all over the place, but that's not surprising because we do go over the place. He had one fascinating statement he said today besides protecting the business. He said the talent today, all talent, hills and baby faces, the young talent are afraid, deathly afraid of selling they're afraid to sell. And that's the magic of the wrestling business. So Bully had great things to say today about the respect of the business, about the fact that the guys have big issues about selling. You don't see a Ricky Morton anymore. You don't see a Jerry Jarrett anymore or Eddie Marlin anymore or a Jerry Lawler anymore or a Bill Dundee anymore. So talk about the lesson I learned and talk also just a few words. Then I'll promise I'll tell some two funny Tojo stories. But talk about that now, Michael St. John, as we're on a Tuesday night talking Memphis wrestling and having a lot of fun tonight. Well, first of all, Tojo would have killed you. Uh, I have no doubt in my mind because that's how serious he was about protecting the business. And uh, uh if Tojo said something, I believe him. I mean, that that's the bottom line. Uh, you know, it's interesting that Bully Ray would say this these things. Uh, he made his mark in ECW. And uh, ECW was a very male-centric wrestling organization. Uh, I guess male to female, it was probably the most male-dominated one that I've ever seen as far as their crowds go. But part of the selling, you know, let's, let's face it. Wrestlers love to, love to, love the women, love to, to bring the women into the, you know, into the emotions of the, of the ring. And that's what selling did is that women would, would have emotional pity or emotional uh, responses to, to the, the baby face when he was getting the living heck kicked out of him or, or busted open or whatever the case may be. But I think what it's, I think what bully is saying in, in a nutshell, if you can dive into what he said and dissect it, I think he's saying that a lot of the wrestlers today, most of the wrestlers today didn't have the advantage of watching the matches in the territories, didn't have the, the opportunities to watch the, spot shows or the weekly towns they were born after that era they grew up on hot spot wrestling or, or high spot high wrestling spot. high spot wrestling with with the with the wwe and certainly with the wcw on national television and i think the art of the cell as regard to wrestling was lost years ago and even with the, some of the top stars that do sell, you know, when The Rock was in the ring, he sold. Did he sell great? But he sold because he knew the business from, you know, third generation down. Uh, I, I think it's a lost art. I, I just, but I think it's a lost art because the people that are teaching, you, you know, you're not learning wrestling by doing and, and out in the crowds and out on the roads, just like we're talking road trips tonight. You're not getting all that advice in the car. You know, how many road trips did you go on, Randy, when the wrestlers were actually talking about their matches 
and reviewing their matches and critiquing themselves and whoever else was in the car. I know I was in on a bunch of that. I heard a bunch of that. So-and-so did this and you should have tried it this way or you, it's better if you do, but you got to, you know, you got to sell that punch and blah, 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 blah. And I think the art of selling all going all the way back to the sixties and where I first started watching wrestling up until today completely is gone, has completely gotten lost. And as far as being afraid to sell it, so much of wrestling now is high, uh, again, high spots and flying yeah. off the top ropes and, you know, I, I made tables. A, uh, exactly. You know, yeah. furniture and stunt all that work. stuff. Stunt, stunt work. work. Yeah. Exactly. It's become a stunt. It's become a stunt. I think it's appropriate as our viewers look at the screen right now uh, that on the screen I'm seeing, I'm on one side, Michael St. John is on the other. And in the middle is Chris Ellis. And that's very important because what he does to pay the bills, what he does for a living is uh, educated. That what he does to make his money and thank God we need our educate. Now, I'm the first to tell you right, right now, I was educated by the Jonesboro school system in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Then I was educated, got the diploma from Arkansas State University in Jonesboro, Arkansas. But I'll tell you the truth where I really got my education. I got my education with Eddie Marlin and Tojo and Jerry Jarrett and Randy West and Jeff Jarrett and Bill Dundee and, and go on. And some of the stories we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about, we talk about Eddie and Randy and, and we're talking to Tojo now. We'll talk about Jerry Jarrett and Frank Morrell and Jeff Jarrett and, and Kurt Henning and Billy Travis and Bill Superstar and D, Frank Morrell and Whoopi D, Brandon Baxter, Harley Race, Jimmy Vaillant. The diploma was a piece of paper, and I could probably go in the next room in a box and, and show you the, uh, the diploma of the Arkansas State diploma. And when I get somebody back on screen, I may go see. I think I have it around here somewhere, and I'm going to look for the day I'm saying. But where I got my education in life, why I can continue to do what I do, still make a living, still make money, still be able to come across and talk and communicate. It's all about what I learned between the yellow lines. My real education is between those yellow lines. My real education is on those roads. When you talk business to Jerry Jarrett, I told this story before, and I'll put this picture up here real quick several years ago and me and Bill Dundee, me and Jerry Jarrett were taking our the guy that was doing Jerry Jarrett's podcast, uh, Sean Reddy wanted to go tour the Mid-South Coliseum in Channel 5 so we went down and there's a picture of me, Bill Dundee and uh, Jerry uh, Jarrett just maybe four years ago. So here's the thing. I can tell you the different lessons, lessons in life. And some people, you learn stuff not to do. You learn bad stuff. And I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. There's bad in life. There's bad on the road. There's bad in wrestling. It's a lot better. And I'm still here. And I'm still kicking. But you learn both the good and the bad. But I learned about this business. And so... For the longest period of, uh, of time, and I'm thinking, days, I'm thinking on, on, on a very important story I put in my book. On Monday night, we'd get back to Memphis, I'd stay at Eddie's house. Then on Tuesdays, I would go with Tojo and Jerry Jarrett to Louisville and come back and go, uh, um, come back and spend the night at Jerry Jarrett's uh, house. But on Tuesday one time, Jerry, uh, and he had talked talk to me about formatted. He, I hate to say the word working with, with me, 
but he was teaching me every week and would show me a format. This is before, um, this is when I was ring announcing in Louisville. I wasn't in the office yet at all, but I would ride with him and he would show me a format and say, it's an eight break show and, and this is the running time and this is the segment time, blah, 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 blah. blah. So one day, uh, he, he was up in the front, so I want to take a nap, but I got got to start working on TV. And I he hated the back seat. So Michael mentioned it earlier, Jerry and Eddie in the front seat. Well, it was Tojo driving, Jerry in the front seat, and I, I was in the back seat of that limousine. Just me, period. We were taking that. So the fact that those ones could have any interest. And so he said to me, he said, he said here's my book and book and look to Monday and see the Monday card. And he said, here's last week's TV format. Here's a legal pad and here's a pen. I'm taking a nap right, or he didn't say back then, you didn't say right TV. He said, lay out TV. And then when I wake up from the nap, go over it with me. I said, okay. So he went to sleep. So I had, had his format from the week before so I could see how to structure it. So I could see how to time it. Uh, and then I had in my briefcase a calculator and all that sort of thing to add up the time. So I put the show together based on the card he had already built. He said, make this card draw. So we did the thing. And he woke up. He said, you got it, kid? I said, yeah, I get it. I got it. He said, he said let, let me see it. And he looked at it, handed it back to me. He said, now tell me every segment. So I told him every segment, and he was quiet and listening. And uh, he said, said, that is great. For your first time, he says, I'm blown away. He said, I had an idea that it would be good because I've been talking to you about television and formatting, and you're learning booking by riding with everybody you ride with. He said, so now I'm going to put the format together. Uh, he said, I'm going to use that. Uh, so after each segment, so of course the uh, first segment, just the open, second segment, then he handed me back what he had. The same segment that I had, he had. He, he did that. Then next segment, he did exactly what I had. Then the next segment, it was different. He said, I'll tell you why I did that. And he told me, this is why what you had, it's too early to do. You're hot shotting. It. It's wrong timing. It's good for eight weeks from now. This is the first week of the program. And he said, so this is what I'm doing instead. Do you understand that? And I said, yes. Any other question? Blah, blah, blah. I didn't even go to the TV show, but I sat there at home and watching segments that I had something to do with, and it was just thrilling. So the road and people like the Tojo Yamamoto and the Jerry Jarrett, it's something, like I said, I got the piece of paper, the diploma from Arkansas State, but I got my education on the road from wrestling. There's just no doubt about it. No doubt about it, Michael. They don't get that anymore. That's 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 part of the missing part of the puzzle. It, it's like putting together a puzzle. You got to put all the pieces on the puzzle to see the whole picture, and they're not getting all that right now. I want to quote something on Twitter just now. It came down nine minutes ago from Dwayne Johnson. It says, we chose the iconic pro wrestling territory of Memphis for our season premiere of Tales from the Territories. I grew up in this territory when my dad wrestled with these legends, and I started my career in Memphis working with my friends, the Jarrett's and Lawler tonight on vice TV. So that, that's big. That, that, that pretty much tells you, it puts it in perspective, but you know, it, the other thing I'm seeing in, in wrestling today or not seeing in wrestling today is there's not a lot of second or third generation wrestlers that are being on the card or highlighted or even in these organizations anymore. There's a few. But you look at guys, you know, Bob Orton Sr. was a good good wrestler, a really good wrestler. Bob Orton Jr. was better than Bob Orton Sr., and Randy Orton's the best of the three. 
Yeah. Um, teeny Jarrett, Jeff's grandmother, was in the wrestling business. She was never a wrestler, but was in the business, understood the business, especially on the business end, but also the business as a whole. Didn't want her son, Jerry, to get in the wrestling business. He got in the wrestling business. He played up his, his, his slight of size to his advantage. Sold like a son of a gun. One of the best sellers ever yes. in the territories. And then Jeff came along. Jeff was an athlete in high school, a very good athlete in high school. Uh, and, and then got into the wrestling business very much like his dad did smaller in stature, but then built himself up became the best of the three. You, know, you, you see where I'm going with this? Yes. In, in, the, in, in certain sports, wrestling being one of them, the second and third generation are always the better. The, the next generation that stays in the business is better than the generation before them. Let's use The Rock and Rocky Johnson. Perfect. Well, Peter Maivia, you know, Peter yeah. Maivia, Rocky Johnson's the son-in-law, The Rock, of the three of them, who's the best wrestler? The Rock. The, the Rock, absolutely. absolutely. And, and the same way with the Funks, and in the same way with the Briscoes. And, the, you know, you could go on and on. The, but those those legacy wrestling families are dying off or dissipating or the next generation's not getting into the business for whatever reason. You lose something there, too. You absolutely do lose no doubt about it. it is 826 on a day that Aaron Judge hit the number 62. Randy West asked me who smartened me up. Nick Goulis did. I think I've told the story on the show that I got called into his office on a Friday afternoon and he threatened to kill me if I said anything to anybody, including my wife and family and, and parents, the, what wrestling was all about. He threatened to kill me too. He didn't show me his gun, but he, I knew he had it in his desk. But, uh, I never, it, it took me forever to, to even breathe a word about all this. And then when it, when kayfabe became dead, dead, yeah, then it was the way you can talk about things. One of the things I want to do right now is get into the funny stories and we'll see if Michael St. John has any funny stories about Tojo Yamamoto and I've got a couple, and there's a couple that I won't talk about, but there's a couple that I will. Funny, funny stories, because if you knew Tojo, there was nobody like Tojo Yamamoto, no doubt about it, in the world. So here we go with Tojo story number one. It was on a Tuesday again. It was on Cumberland Hills Drive in Hendersonville, Tennessee, the big house on that big hill. Tojo came up and picked us up. Tojo, as Michael said, John has to step away, and he will be back in about two minutes, and he's not going to get that fantastic uh, story, but uh, he gave us a warning that his grandson is coming. So here we go. I want everybody to relate to what I'm going to talk about. I want you to picture the story. Chris, I want you to be with me. I want you to stick with me. I want you to stay with me. I want you to pay attention to what I'm saying. So we get in the limo again. And I'm in the back of the limo again. And Jerry Jarrett is front passenger. Tojo Yamamoto with this little white hat. And, and he's driving the car. And we leave Hendersonville, Tennessee. And we get to two Mount Pike, or we get to exit 97 and at the press by the Cracker Barrel and we shoot up on the on-ramp to I-65 northbound to head to Louisville, Kentucky. But as soon as we hit the ramp, Jerry Jarrett says to Tojo Yamamoto, he said, Toach, he called him Toach. That was Tojo's nickname, Toach. Anyway, he says, Toach, he said, pull over. Uh, real quick, he said, I got to dump my spit cup. He had filled up his spit cup, so he wanted to dump the spit cup. So Tojo merged in the entrance, and when he was on the ramp for the entrance, and he, he pulled over, and, and Jerry rolled down the window. But it just so happened, none of us, not Jerry Jarrett, not Randy Hills, not Tojo Yamamoto, we didn't realize 
right at the spot that Tojo slowed down to stop to let Jerry Jarrett dump that nasty spit cup was a head shocker. So this head shocker, and I thank God I was in the seat behind Tojo, the head shocker opened the door, threw a bag into the car, and sat down. He thought we were stopping to pick him up. Tojo went absolutely, absolutely nuts and absolutely cut a problem. You no good son of a gun. You, you no good son of a gun. You scared Randy Hale. Get your ass. I'll kill you. Son of a gun. Get out of, out of here. And Tojo reached around uh, the seat and uh, pulled a gun and put a gun to the guy's head. Get out of this car. Get out of this car. So the guy just fell out of the car. Tojo had that gun and Tojo yelled at me and said, throw his bag on top of him. So I took the bag and stood and hit him in the head. So that's Tojo story number one. The empty Hit shocker at the same exit. How about that for a story? Well, actually, I have to admit, you've told me that before, so I, I knew I knew about it. But it's I can't imagine. What but I was on through. camera this time. I was on yeah. camera this time. Yeah, you did I really great. Tell a story. I can visualize it. I just can't imagine being that guy thinking, "Hey, these people give me a ride. You get in, you got a gun pointed at you." Well, story number two, the Tojo story number two, and this is funny too. This is not crazy. This is not wild. This is not anything illegal. None of that, but it's a funny story. And if I told you this story, I'm sure I told you the second story because it's the two Tojo stories that I always tell. And I'm sure if you read my book, you're, the, you're an educator, so I know you know how to read. I'm sure you did read my book. You know you I read your book. You, you, love, you know I read the book. You love, love Memphis Wrestling, story number two. So we're going to Louisville. Everything happened on the way to Louisville. Everything happened. So here we go to Louisville. So we freaking into Kentucky and into Bowling Green, and we're, we're man, 85, 90 miles an hour when Tojo's driving. No, 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 no. I am driving. I am driving because I had a 1987 Mercury Grand Prix and a big show, big, big car. So I'm driving. So Tojo said, says, I want a snack. I want a drink. I said, we'll stop in Cave City. That good? He said, yeah, that's good. So we stopped. He said, you going in? I said, no, I don't need anything. I got my water here. You go ahead and go in. So Tojo goes in. So in the meantime, this wouldn't happen in a million years. So I'm in a black 1987 Grand Marquis, uh, and I'm parking a spot. Well, all of a sudden, Tojo's in buying his stuff, and here comes a woman and she parks right beside me in a 1987 black Grand Marquis. And I said, this could be interesting. So I hear, about at the same time, here comes Tojo. And Tojo is walking out. And Tojo's staring in his bag. And Tojo, watch what he got. And Tojo is so excited. And he's looking through it. And Tojo walks right up to the wrong car. Walks up to the wrong car. And I'm just letting him do it. He opens that door, sets right down, slams the door. The woman has her her window down. I have my window down. And the woman screams, ah! Japanese guy just said, the stranger just sat down, ball-headed, with a bag of food, and she screams, and Tojo, still looking at the bag, didn't realize he was in the wrong car, so she screamed, he screamed. Ah, I scared Tojo. So to I blew my horn and waved at Tojo. So Tojo opened that door, he stormed over, opened the door, 
David, Randy Hills, you no good son of a gun, you son of a gun, I'll kill you. He threatened to kill me again, but this is in a ribbon way. He said, you make Tojo walk back and forth. I said, no, Tojo, you made yourself look like a fool when, when you got in the wrong car. By this point, I was in the office. I was a little more cocky. By this point, I was in, in the office and that sort of thing, but hilarious story. Now, did I tell you that story, Chris? Yeah, you told me that too. And that, that I mean, that is funny because I could. What are the odds of two grand marquees, same year, same color, parked side by side? And I'm surprised that doesn't happen more often. I mean, actually, I've walked out to vehicles that look like mine before and tried to unlock them. I'm like, why's my why's my door lock not working? So I can I can see that happening. As much as y'all were on the road, I, I mean, I'm surprised there's not hundreds of things and there may be some of which you can't tell i'm sure yes but i you know but like i was only on the road racing for 13 years and so y'all were on there a whole lot longer than that and i got i know there's plenty of tales to tell here's a funny story and we'll get to to a writing click in a little bit of of, of frank morrell the spoiler the french angel and whoopie d we rode together a lot I just changed cars, and and I had a 1993 Cadillac, and so we get get in in the thing, but but there was something I I forgot what you could or uh, could do. Frank Frank was driving, uh, and then I was in the passenger seat, and and so fully I know what it was. What we told him, said, we're going to rip Frank, man, said, said, let, let me, <laughs> let me have, have your, your remote or uh, your keys. So I gave him my, my keys and it would lock and unlock the doors. This is the simplest of rips. I mean, the simplest of rips. So what we, I think this was on a trip to Memphis and, and about 50 miles in all of, uh, Sudden, Whoopi clicked the door, locked the door, and Frank just glanced at the thing and then looked back at the road. Then he 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 unlocked the door. Frank looked at it again, and he he said, "Frank said, said boss said said are you are you locking of the doors?" I said. I said, no, I'm drinking my my drink. Uh, I'm drinking my drink. I'm not reaching over there uh, to the the lock. And the, then, then I, I said, I'm not doing that at all. And Whoopi did it again. <laughs> and did it again. And did it again. And Frank went nuts. Frank said, Randy, you just spent $30,000 on this car and, and the this is dangerous. And he whooped it over or the side of the road and said, call a coat, call a tow truck, call a tow truck. So I'm getting out of this car. So this is dangerous. The, the door, there's a ghost in this car. Somebody's locking the doors and I'm locking the doors. I can fall out the door. You can fall out the door. Just a, a, a mess. And finally, we smartened him up to the rip. Finally smartened him up to the the real. Those had probably just come out about that time, hadn't they? I mean, those people didn't have those back then. Yeah, they didn't have have it all. Michael, did you get back in time to hear that story? I did. I heard the whole thing. That's great. That's good. And knowing Frank, knowing knowing Angel, it, it that makes it even funnier. That makes it even funnier. Now, did you hear my stories on Tojo? I heard the first one. I, I didn't get the second one, but, uh, you know, I told you the Tojo story I have. And, uh, a, a few weeks ago, uh, about him playing the, when we were doing the dirty dribbler basketball, at kicks one Oh four and wrestling. And we did a thing at beach high school, uh, assembly program in the afternoon, one afternoon about this time of year. And, uh, we'd play a basketball game with George's basketball team against our, our, Dish jockeys at fun or at kicks 104. And then uh they do a wrestling match after a couple of mad they do set up the ring, do a couple of matches. 
And Tojo's sitting there and he's going in. They, they, they he had just gone in. They, he was on the starting lineup of Georgia's team. And Tojo was not really adept to dribbling a basketball. Number one, he was close to the ground. And number two, he wasn't that all coordinated about the basketball thing. Okay. He'd take a shot and every now and then hit a shot, but he wasn't all that. Cool. So he came over to the, the bench. He's sitting there and these kids are this little girl. This, and this is at Beach Junior or Beach High School. And they had, the, at that time, I think they had the seventh, eighth, ninth, and then 10th, 11th, 12th on that same campus. And uh, this girl walks by Tojo and uh, she looks at him and she says to him, she says, you suck. And Tojo said, and you got no hair by your pussy. And I knew you no, you got no hair on your pussy. And the, the, we just died. I mean, everybody, the jocks are laughing. The, the rest of the team's laughing. The people on the floor don't know what the heck just happened. But he slapped, he, that girl no said her, no sooner said that. And Tojo whipped back with that statement. And that was so, it, it was just classic Tojo Yamamoto. But uh, there's some good stories about Tojo on the road. Uh, uh, one of my favorites is more of a tender story is coming back on the bus from Dallas one night. It started. And uh, we always would stop in uh, Arca, uh, in our, uh, Arca, uh, Arca, not Arcadelphia. Is Arcadelphia. It Arca Arcadelphia. Right there on the Arkansas, Texas, right near Louisiana. Or Texarkana. Texarkana. That's it. Texarkana. Tar Texarkana. And we'd stop at the Flying J. And then be about 3.30 in the morning and I'd be asleep, but the bus would stop and I'd wake up and I'd go in, use the restroom, maybe get some water or something. And Tojo would say, Mike St. John, give me pork skins. And I would buy him a bag of pork skins and he would eat them the rest of the night. Tojo didn't sleep on the bus. I, I, I never, in fact, I, he made doze off for a few seconds, but he never bunked on the bus. And we were in on Waylon Jennings bus and, and I'd be sound asleep in the back because the boys protected me. But uh, uh, that was that got to be a, a standard thing. And he was he was starting to get sick, and he knew he had kidney problems even at that time. But every time we'd stop at the Flying J, but I never let him pay for. It. He'd always want to put money in my pocket or or put money in my hand or whatever. I never let him pay. It was for gosh sakes. He, I learned more in wrestling from Tojo than just about anybody in the world. A bag of pork skins is a, is a good education. Is a, is tuition for a good education is no problem. So, but he was he always loved his pork skins and especially the ones that came at Flying J. That Flying J exit five on the Arkansas side, it's where you turn to go to the racetrack. Really, I've been there I'm many right. times. Yeah, that, that's where that was the wrestling bus stop every every. Uh, uh, Friday night going into Saturday morning you know, on that trip from Dallas to Memphis. There is a there's a picture of the angel Frank Morrell and one of the, this is Jerry Lawler's favorite Randy Hill story and the reason it's his favorite story is that I've told it and told it and told it and told it. It's because it is a rib that backfired and it is a situation that he stirred this story up. So I just want everybody to see a picture of Frank Morrell, our referee at the time, the good old angel, Frank Morrell. So, again, everything happened in Louisville. It was a, in Louisville, and it was a Tuesday night. Well, on Monday night, we left Memphis about midnight, headed to Nashville went home and then we had to get up early because we had an afternoon wrestling event at the state prison in kentucky so here you go and i'm with bill dundee or bill dundee's with me jeff and frank and scott steiner's in one car so this had to be 1988 1989 so all's good and i'm scared to death and I knew the toughest darn guy in the territory was Scott Steiner. I did not leave his side. <laughs> Absolutely didn't leave his side. And another thing, here's pretty boy, probably 20-year-old Jeff Jarrett, that I won't use the language, but I think you can imagine what those prisoners said, was saying to Jeff what they wanted to do with Jeff. You can just imagine. 
that, right? They were saying they wanted to blah, blah him, right? So it was a stressful situation, but we got our money. We had no riots. We had no prison riots. It all went good. So we got in the car and we're early. So we go eat in downtown Louisville. Then we go back to the Louisville Gardens and we're like three and a half hours early for the matches. So we're going to take a nap. Well, I couldn't really sleep, so I I get up walking around. The dressing rooms are down a set of stairs, downstairs. Went upstairs through a double door into the arena. Frank ends up coming coming out, and we're walking and talking, and he couldn't sleep either. Finally, the building manager stops me and asks me a question or two. I mean, how you doing or whatever. It was nothing important. Frank kept walking away. I finished up my conversation, and then if I'm started walking toward Frank. He's continued to walk, and then there's a big loud knock on on the back of the door. Big loud knock, and Frank said, "said I'll race you to the door." And he had a big, huge because oh, I'd been stopped for five minutes. He had a huge leap, so. I started running and I ended up uh, not catching him and he won, you know, obviously. It was obviously going to be. So then I'm giving finishes later on that night. I'm downstairs. All of a sudden, Waller screaming, Randy Hills, Randy Hills, come here, Randy Hills. So I go upstairs. Waller's up there and Paula Waller's up there. Frank's up there. Randy West is up there, I believe. There was a lot of people up there. The Hodegum crew was up there, and Lawler shaking his head like he's disappointed. And you know how Lawler is in ribbon and, and that sort of thing. He's the, I cannot believe it. You let your elder be. I said, no, he didn't be. I said, he cheated, blah, blah, blah. And then Lawler says, we need a rematch. We need a rematch. I said, I want a rematch. He didn't be me at that start. It was a little serious. So, Soon as you walk in from that alley, you can picture the alley, right, Michael? You walk in, and before the dressing room area, there's another door, but we were in a little, a pretty wide hallway. So one end of the, the room was going to be the start line, and the other end was going to be the finish line. And Mike Patterson was the Louisville policeman, and he was going to make this. He was going to be the official starter. He wasn't going to shoot his gun, but he's going to blow his whistle. Blow his whistle. So here we go, and I've got the lead, and Frank's 25 years older than me, and I knew I could do the thing. So it wasn't a long period. So we're Frank had his head down, and he was getting to it, and he was going with it, and he was blowing and going, and all going big time. And so had his head down. But here's the deal. I look up and I notice we're at the end of the runway. There's nothing but a break brick wall right there. So I start stopping, which is a common sense thing to do. You have a concrete wall, you stop. Well, Frank wasn't worried about that. He was looking down. He thought I was blowed up when I was stopping. So he put it in high gear, another gear, ran head on into that freaking wall. Blood went sky high, boom, shooting all over the place. He broke his wrist, he broke his arm. Ooh. All neighbors had uh, had some kind of car issues. Frank was the only referee. I was a nervous wreck. We had to call the hospital I called the ambulance, and so I'm 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 telling uh, Waller. I said I'm going to Frank to the hospital, and he said said who he said we don't have a referee. I said just figure out something. You'll figure out something. He said have you given the finishes? I said yes. She said okay. So I took Frank to the thing, and then. The story is Waller and I both felt guilty about that. So every week 
we we average what Frank normally made every week. Say it was six hundred dollars a week. I'd pay three, and Laura would pay three. We made sure that he was paid. Now Jerry Jarrett told me later, just when he when I was living with Eddie, and I told that story. I said me me and um, Laura felt bad for for Frank, and me and Laura split the six hundred dollars. And Jerry Jarrett said. Frank was double dipping that he called Jerry Jarrett and whining about not having any money and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and Jerry Jarrett said the company paid him $600. So he got a broken leg, but we paid his hospital bills. Plus, he was getting $600 a week for me and Laura and $600 if Jerry, again, embellishment. Not just Jerry Jarrett, anybody in the wrestling business. I mean, that happened. So I don't know whether to believe Jerry Jarrett in, or if he was just trying to make the story better. What do you think, Mike? Well, the Braves just won the pennant. So, uh, you know, that's that's typical Jerry Jarrett. Uh, and, it's, and that's Frank. I mean, who knows? I If I had to guess, I would think, I would say, I'm going to say that Jerry's ribbing you, Randy. I, I think, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. That's what I would think. That's I what think I would think. You. I think he's ribbing. I absolutely think that as well. But it makes a good uh, story. How about you, Chris? Had I ever told you that story? No, I've never heard that story. But hearing you tell stories, talk about embellishment. I've always said for years, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. That, that's that a great word. And one that of my former co workers always, when he introduces me to people, one of my best buddies says, Now, when Ellis starts telling stories, remember, he'll lie, embellish, make things up. He said, Don't believe anything he tells you because he doesn't tell stories on him. He wants to say they're all lies. Well, there are part truths in those stories, not all truths, but part truths. Michael? Truth. I agree. That's a great comment. That's a great, uh, never let, never let a good story, let a, let a, the truth get in the way of a good story. I'm anxious to see on the, the, the territories, the uh, tales from the territories tonight. There's part of it that I hope didn't get caught on the, uh, end up on the cutting room floor of Jerry Jarrett talking about Mario Galento and the, uh, the angle that, uh, well, I, I guess it was, it was a shoot, it was a shoot. Uh, from everything I heard that, uh, happened in Memphis where, I guess Mario Galento got I now if I'm not mistaken, this all occurred when Jerry was doing the book for Nick and Roy. Is that correct, Randy? Yes. It was yes. And Mario Galento had uh, come into the territory out of Atlanta, I believe, uh, from from uh, uh, Ray Gunkel's uh group and uh, apparently got got fired in Memphis or got sideways or or didn't go through with a, a program or a finish or something, got sideways with Jerry Jarrett. And went after Jerry's good eye. And to hear Jerry talk about it, that uh, apparently Tojo and uh, Jackie Fargo and him got a hold of Mario Galento and an eyeball ended up on the on the canvas. I don't know how much truth it is. I don't know the whole story. It was uh, not something that I, I was aware of. It, it had happened, but I never saw it. Do you know the background on it, Randy? I've heard the story a million times but I heard it a million different ways. So I can't tell you what the truth is of that as well. I'm telling you what we're going to do right now because it's been the subject of today. It's the tales from the territory as we talk a lot of the great territories. And I didn't get nowhere near finished with the road stories. We'll make this a multiple part yeah, I've got so much to go, and I really want to be off the air. And, and so everybody can find Vice TV, Vice TV, whatever the heck it's called, and, and watch that. So I don't want to be on, on the, the air then. But just the show today so far, Chris, as we go into the closing part of this show, your thoughts on, on the show today? Well, it's always great to hear the behind-the-scenes things. Because, again, my, my perspective from the show is a, a, from a fan. So fans want to know about the behind-the-scenes stuff. So stories you and Michael share that y'all got to live through, 
we get to vicariously live those with relive those with you. So that's pretty cool. And I really like the way we started the show, paying tribute to Lance. Hard to believe it's been five years since we lost Lance. I mean, seems like it hadn't been two, but it's just hard to believe that's been that period of time. Michael, final thoughts. Well, I always enjoy telling stories, but I'm the most thing I, I really enjoy is hearing the stories. And Randy, you've got a bunch of them. And, and uh, some of the stories that came, when you think about some of the stories that came out of this territory, it's hard to believe. I mean, they're just, they're too, they're too funny or too true to be true, but they're true. And, now, I, and I think that's ironic for this area. Some of the stories, you know, I have an educator with me. I'm careful what I say. I don't know if next week might be a good time for you not. I want you to watch the show, but I don't know if you should 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 be on screen as I tell some of these stories because I am going to still. You know, there's a couple I'm going to clean up. There's a couple I'm not going going to clean up, Chris. Okay. So I'm going to warn you right now. Duly noted. Duly noted. So it might be a good week for you to take off because we don't want you in any trouble, right? <laughs> That's right. Not for six more years, and after that, it won't matter. <laughs> now, I tell you, the first thing I'm going to do when I get off here is that I'm going to watch that home run from Aaron Judge. How about you, Michael? I saw I saw it on the on the replay, and he he had that. It's that classic swing. I can't wait to get my tops now baseball card of that of that swing because that's going to be one to have. But. It was iconic, and when he hit the ball, when he when he swung at the ball, there was just no doubt. There was just no doubt. Now I'm going to bring up a question. We'll go. This is something for people to think about, Coach. It's baseball. Baseball is a sport that it's not an easy sport to play, and the best are the best because they're the best. Did that pitcher drill that ball on that first pitch? Did he throw him a high a high a high heater? It was it was actually at, at the belt level. Did he? groove that pitch to give him a shot at that or did he tip him off on that patch is it is it a work is the 60 second home run a work no i don't think so no i don't think the guy wants to be in the record book known for that you know if you, they, he got professional pride as a competitor he didn't want to be like al downing of the dodgers what's he known for he gave hey, up Henry Aaron's home run so the guy whoever it was didn't want to be that guy so no i don't think so i don't i don't think it's a work and who did Al Downing pitch for before he went to the Dodgers? He was in the highest of his career. He was in the twilight of his career when he was pitching to to uh, Hank Aaron when he hit uh, seven one four. Who did he start out with? You know, Michael, I should know, but I don't recall. The New York Yankees. Okay. We're out of time, guys. Say bye, Michael. Bye, Michael. I love you guys. Thank you, Randy. Coach, always a pleasure. Good luck. Say this bye. Yeah. Say yeah. bye, Chris. Bye. See you, RH. I appreciate it. For Michael St. John and Chris Ellis, Randy Hills, I'm out. Talking Memphis Wrestling with Randy Hills, featuring Michael St. John, Pat Tremble, and special guests.